Hello YouTube. In the last video we outlined Popper's falsificationist model of the scientific method. Today we're going to look at some problems for Popper, so let's get into it. First of all, uh, it seems that there are hypotheses that start out as falsifiable, but have become unfalsifiable. Consider the claim that Jupiter has four moons. When these were initially discovered by Galileo, it could easily have turned out to be wrong. Um, perhaps, as some astronomers at the time suggested, the telescope was not a reliable method for learning about the heavens. Or, or perhaps Galileo did indeed see four objects, but these were something entirely different from moons. Uh, there, there were plausible ways that Galileo's hypothesis could have been falsified. But arguably this isn't really the case anymore. I mean, we, I mean we've sent probes to Jupiter. We have photographs of its moons. There really isn't any serious doubt anymore that Jupiter has uh, at least four moons. So is the claim that Jupiter has four moons no longer scientific? Has that become non-scientific or pseudo-scientific? Um, and of course this happens with, with many scientific claims. Some uh, scientific claims seem to just become uh, beyond uh, falsification. Uh, they, they just become established facts. Now, of course, it may be argued, well, actually, this is falsifiable. So uh, consider radical sceptical claims, such as that we're all living in the matrix. In that case, maybe Jupiter and its moons uh, are some sort of mass hallucination. It's possible that one day we might wake up to find that we're all living in the matrix, and this would falsify the claims about Jupiter. Now, there are several worries you might have about this response, but I think the most important is simply that this is not really a degree of scepticism that is uh, actually used in science. Right? The, the, the sceptical possibility that we might all be in the matrix isn't a scientific hypothesis. It goes far beyond the degree of doubt that scientists actually display. I mean, maybe one way to put this is that at a certain point, it seems that scientists simply accept certain problems as solved. Um, yeah, I mean, that the, the case of Jupiter's moons is just solved. It's not something that we're going to try to falsify anymore. Um, and, and maybe that's not necessarily to say that, uh, that this matter has now become unfalsifiable, but it's just eventually it just becomes fruitless trying to falsify a particular hypothesis. And we might want our theory of the scientific method to explain why this is. We need to say under what conditions it is acceptable to move on and to stop trying to falsify a hypothesis. Um, for Popper, it looks like we should never stop trying. But, um, you know, it seems fairly ridiculous to insist that scientists should try to falsify the claim that Jupiter has at least four moons. Uh, perhaps a more serious threat is posed by probabilistic hypotheses. Remember, uh, Popper claims that the logic of science is purely deductive. You can't ever prove a theory to be true, but you can prove it uh, to be false. Um, and you can deductively prove it to be false. The failure to observe uh, gravitational light bending would deductively refute general relativity. But consider a, a hypothesis such as smoking lowers the probability of cancer. Now we think that this is false, um, and the, the primary reason is that when we examine smokers we find that they have higher rates of cancer. I mean, the, the claim that smoking lowers the probability of cancer is, that looks about as wrong as a as a scientific claim can get. But the problem is that observing hi uh, higher rates of cancer among smokers does not deductively falsify this hypothesis. It only provides inductive evidence that this hypothesis is false. Uh, but, but as we've noted, Popper thinks that induction is illegitimate. So to, to put this another way, everything that we've observed so far, every study of smokers that we've ever done is logically compatible with the claim that smoking lowers the probability of cancer. No matter how many studies we do that show that smokers have higher rates of cancer, it's still logically possible that smoking lowers the probability of cancer. Um, so one way to maybe see this is to compare tossing a coin, right? It's possible to toss a fair coin a million times and have it land heads every time. So no matter how many times we toss a coin and it lands heads, the hypothesis that the coin is fair is not deductively refuted. The best we can do is make an inductive inference that it's, it's likely that the coin is not fair. So, you know, if you, if you toss a coin a million times 
and it lands heads every time. You'll probably say it's quite, it's likely that this is not a fair coin, but but it's not. Uh, you haven't deductively proven that it's not a fair coin. So probabilistic hypotheses cannot be falsified in in Popper's sense. So so it seems that for Popper, probabilistic hypotheses have to be considered unscientific, and that's a pretty serious problem because many parts of science are probabilistic. Probability is central to quantum physics, to many areas of biology, to economics, to sociology. It's quite common to find probabilistic claims, but you can't logically uh, refute them by, uh, you know, you, you can't deductively refute the hypothesis that this is a fair coin by uh, tossing it and seeing it land heads a million times. Um, so, you know, we, it, it's that, that only provides inductive evidence, but inductive evidence is precisely what Popper rejects. So, uh, so I think this is um, going to be a bit of a problem. As a matter of fact, uh, this difficulty, this problem that we can't deductively refute hypotheses, this extends even to non-probabilistic hypotheses. In the last video, we mentioned the problem that uh, we can always save a theory from refutation by introducing ad hoc hypotheses or ad hoc adjustments. Uh, and this is connected to this idea of confirmation holism, um, or it's sometimes known as the Duhem-Quine thesis, after Pierre Duhem and W.V.O. Quine. Um, basically, the point of confirmation holism is that no hypothesis is ever tested in isolation. It's only against a whole background of auxiliary hypotheses that we can make experimental tests. But it follows from that that if, if the experiment gives us an unexpected result, then we can always reject one of these background hypotheses rather than the original hypothesis we had in mind. So we can shield a hypothesis from refutation by constantly making ad hoc adjustments elsewhere. We already discussed this in the previous video. As we saw, uh, Popper says, well, it's OK for scientists to make ad hoc adjustments, but this degrades the scientific status of a theory. Uh, so, so that's a solution to that problem. But I think that there's perhaps a deeper problem here, which is, given confirmation holism, it follows that theories are never deductively refuted. So Sir Popper wants the logic of science to be purely deductive, right? Recall his schema for general relativity. He says if, oops, if general relativity is true, then uh, you know, we will observe gravitational light bending. So if we don't observe gravitational light bending, we can conclude that general relativity is not true. But in practice, the inference that general relativity is false is, is, not, one that's, uh, is not one that's made on the basis of deduction. Uh, so from the failure to observe light bending, we, we can't deductively conclude that general relativity is false. We can always retain general relativity by making the ad hoc maneuver of modifying some auxiliary hypotheses. So we, we might propose, well, maybe the Earth's atmosphere interacts with light in such a way as to alter its path. Or uh, more prosaically, we might propose that there's something wrong with our photographic equipment or something like that. All that deductively follows from the failure to observe light bending is that a whole set of claims about the world is false. So, so the, the, the schema is really more like this. If general relativity plus A plus B plus C plus D and so on, and you know, a whole indefinite set of hypotheses, uh, so if, if all of those hypotheses are true, then we will observe gravitational light bending. Uh, if, so, so if we don't observe gravitational light bending, then we can conclude that well, either general relativity is not true, or A is not true, or B is not true, or C is not true, or etc. But the problem, of course, is that this is this is not really a very interesting result. Um, I mean, we, we sort of already know that some of our beliefs are false, right? Anybody who has a reasonable degree of epistemic modesty will be prepared to accept that they're probably wrong about some things. So to say that, well, you know, among general relativity plus an indefinite set of background hypotheses, there is at least one false belief. That's a completely trivial conclusion. And perhaps a more important problem here is that in itself, the failure to observe gravitational light bending doesn't tell us exactly which hypothesis is false, right? It, it, all it tells us is that 
one of these hypotheses, hypotheses is, is false. So the point is that deciding which hypothesis to reject isn't deductive. Logic can't compel you to uh, reject any particular hypothesis. It can, it can compel you to reject one of these, right? but it can't tell you which one to reject. Um, so it, it seems then that, there's gonna, that there has to be more involved in the scientific method than mere deduction. A further objection to falsificationism concerns the connection of science and practice. So um, we saw that for Popper, we should not believe that scientific theories are true. We should not even believe that they're more likely to be true than not, right? No matter how many tests a theory passes, we should not be any more confident in it than we were before we started testing it. There's, there's no such thing as confirmation. Tests provide no support to theories. That's all very well in the abstract, but we run into problems when we try to apply science in practice. Peter Godfrey Smith, in his Introduction to Philosophy of Science, gives a nice example of building a bridge. So if we want to build a bridge, we're going to use physical theories to tell us what kinds of designs are stable and to tell us what kinds of uh, structures and materials will support the weight that the bridge needs to carry and, and so on. So here we need to apply our scientific theories to a practical problem. Indeed, one of the great things about science is how we can, can use it to develop technology and, and infrastructure and to manipulate the world to our own benefit. But the difficulty here is that we have to make a choice about uh, what theory to use when designing the bridge. Uh, obviously, we shouldn't use a theory that's been falsified, but there are an indefinite number of theories that are very different to current physical theory and that which have never been tested and therefore are still currently un uh, non unfalsified. Popper says that there's no reason to have more confidence in current physical theory, which has been tested many times and survived all the tests, uh, versus any untested theory. But then it looks like surely it would be no less rational, no less reasonable to use some completely new untested theory to build the bridge rather than to use our current physical theory. Now, of course, if anybody did build a bridge using a completely untested theory, presumably the bridge would fail and they would be prosecuted for uh, criminal negligence and uh, violating basic safety laws. But how can this be justified on the falsificationist view? For the falsificationist, our current theories and any random untested theory are completely on a par. There's no more reason to believe... Uh, any one unfalsified theory than any other, right? It, do, it doesn't matter how many tests a theory passes, that should not raise our confidence in the theory by any degree. So so this is going to be uh, quite a bit of a, a problem for the falsificationist, right? How can we how can we justify this sense that that we should use accepted theories rather than you know random untested theories? How is, how is that justified? This problem doesn't arise only when applying science in practice. It also uh, comes up in science itself when we try to uh, design scientific experiments. We've already uh, noted confirmation holism, the fact that all experiments involve making assumptions about background theory. Uh, so here's, here's one example. Uh, in astronomy, uh, quasars are a type of active galactic nuclei. They're extremely compact regions with enormous energies. Uh, some may have up to 100 times the luminosity of uh, the Milky Way. Interestingly, uh, all the quasars currently known are very distant. They're billions of light years away. And this allows us to make a rather simple hypothesis. We can say, well, all quasars are over one billion light years away. We have our hypothesis, and now if we are good falsificationists, we will try to show that this hypothesis is false. So, so uh, this is what we're doing. We want to refute the hypothesis, so we're going to try to find a quasar that's less than one billion light years away. It seems simple enough. Uh, but it turns out that measuring uh, distances in astronomy isn't always very easy, uh, and it, it rests on a background of theory. Uh, to measure very large distances, astronomers use the redshift of light. So uh, the universe is expanding. As it expands, light that is travelling across the universe is stretched, producing longer wavelengths, and this shifts it into the redder part of the spectrum. Red is uh, longer wavelength, blue is shorter wavelength. So we say that 
uh, that the light is red shifted. Uh, so here's a, a, a diagram. Um, this galaxy is uh, moving away from this observer, and so the light is red shifted. The light is stretched. It's red shifted as it moves away. Uh, it's moving towards this observer, so the light is uh, kind of squashed, it, and that uh, blue shifts it. Um, it's uh, it's 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 basically like the uh, Doppler effect that you get with sound waves. When a when a train a train sounds different when it's coming towards you than it does when it, when it's going away. Uh, the sound is blue shifted, as it were, when it's coming towards you, and it's red shifted as it recedes. It's the same with light. As objects uh, move uh, away from us or towards us, the character of the light alters. Now, the further away an object is, uh, the greater the degree of redshift, because uh, the light from an object that's further away will have undergone a greater amount of stretching. And this means that we can use the degree of redshift to give a rough estimate of an object's distance. The greater the redshift, the further away the object is. So if we want to test our hypothesis that all quasars are further away than a billion light years, we need to look for quasars, we measure the degree of, of, of the redshift of their light. And if we find a quasar with a sufficiently low redshift, uh, the hypothesis will be falsified. But now recall that the falsificationist says, well, there's no reason whatsoever to think that any one theory is more likely to be true than another. So the question is, if we have no more reason to believe one theory than another. Why design the experiment in this way? Why look for redshifting? Any other number of currently unfalsified theories about the nature of light would be just as good to use in designing our experiment. So we might propose some theory according to which uh, light is, the light produced by quasars behaves differently to all other kinds of light. Right? I mean, some, some really weird, crazy theory that has never been tested before. Um, but in that case, if that theory is correct, the degree of redshift wouldn't tell us anything about the distance of a quasar. Um, so you know, no matter how absurd this theory might be, as, as long as it hasn't yet been refuted, as long as it hasn't yet been falsified, why shouldn't we design the experiment in the terms of this theory instead? And of course, if we did design the experiment in terms of this theory, then actually redshift wouldn't tell us anything. We'd, we'd have to come up with some other experiment. I mean, so this point is related to the problem of confirmation holism that we mentioned earlier. You can't test a hypothesis in isolation. You have to assume a background of theory. So the question is, how can the falsificationist justify assuming one theory rather than another? When we design experiments to test quasar distances, how can we justify assuming the currently accepted theory of light and physics rather than some other, other theory that is completely different but that hasn't yet been tested? Um, so, uh, it seems then that Popper's view faces some, some problems, but there is a, a core idea of falsificationism that you might think is untouched by the objections we've considered so far. And this is the thought that science involves making risky uh, hypotheses, risky conjectures, followed by attempted refutations. Right? Scientists should proceed by proposing these kind of bold hypotheses about the world and then trying to refute these hypotheses. This, this is the, the algorithm that good science uses. Now, if we, t if we treat falsificationism just as a claim about the proper scientific method, well, actually, it's not really so radical and it, and it might seem right. But actually, there are some problems even with this core falsificationist claim. Uh, one difficulty is posed by what we might call purely exploratory research. Uh, this is research where the researchers don't have any particular hypothesis in mind. Let's say a microbiologist is interested in Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Uh, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is caused by infectious proteins and it leads to the uh, degeneration of the brain. Uh, I think in the UK there was a bit of a scare, uh, a few, maybe about a decade ago, um, so it was called mad cow disease, and uh, it seemed that some people were getting this disease from, from cattle or there was some infected meat or something like that, um, and that was a kind of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Uh, so anyway, a scientist might ask, well, what is the structure of the protein that causes Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease? And she might be completely open-minded about the result. She might not have any particular hypothesis in mind. So there's no hypothesis being tested in her experiment. Yet this still seems like uh, an exemplary example of scientific research.
there's, there's so it's just, there's no bold hypothesis being proposed, but that still it still seems like this is science. Uh, Sven Hansen um, has an interesting article on this called Falsificationism Falsified. Uh, he examined all 70 articles published in the year 2000 in the journal Nature, and he found that 49 of them are purely exploratory. Uh, the, the authors uh, did not identify any particular hypothesis or particular outcomes beforehand. Uh, they didn't you know, try to falsify any particular hypotheses. They were just... They were just exploring. They, they, um, you know, maybe they reported on molecular structures or gene sequences or new experimental techniques and so on. They, they didn't propose a bold hypothesis, and they didn't try to falsify anything. And there are many more examples that that we might give of this. Uh, so this is quite common, I think, in astronomy. Think about various uh, maps of the Milky Way or maps of other galaxies, or think about um, attempts to discover extrasolar planets or the collection of spectrums from stars. Uh, these seem to be examples of exploratory research. The astronomer searching for extrasolar planets doesn't need to have any particular hypothesis in mind. She's just trying to increase our set of data about planets in the galaxy. So this is a bit of a problem, because this looks like scientific research that actually doesn't follow the falsificationist method of make a risky prediction followed by an attempt to refute it. Because there is no risky prediction here, and there is no attempt to refute anything. Now, of course, the falsificationist might respond, well, you know, look, these, these cases are examples of uh, scientists developing new hypotheses that are now open to potential falsification. After the structure of the Kreutzfeldt-Jakob uh, protein has been proposed, other scientists can come along and try to falsify it. So we still have uh, a hypothesis followed by attempted falsification. And I think that's reasonable enough, but there are two points we have to bear in mind here. The first is that the, the simple fact of the matter is that a great deal of scientific work doesn't actually involve uh, trying to refute any hypotheses. So, by placing the emphasis on this, uh, it, it does seem that falsificationism obscures uh, how a lot of science works. Falsificationism is a claim about the proper scientific method, right? It it it, it, it sort of claims, you know, propose the risk hypothesis, then you make an attempted refutation. But much of the time, scientists simply don't follow this method. Most scientific work, or at least much scientific work, just doesn't involve making a risky hypothesis and then attempting to refute it. Scientists don't use this methodology. A second point that we have to bear in mind uh, in, in, with respect to this response is that actually very often, uh, after a result has been obtained, often what happens is it's just accepted. Scientists generally, they don't try to falsify accepted results generally they'll just assume that they're correct and then try to build on them. So with the Kreutzfeldt-Jakob example, let's say one microbiologist identifies the structure of the uh, Kreutzfeldt-Jakob protein. Well, the next microbiologist will probably not try to falsify this. Instead, she'll just try to build on that work. So you know, she might ask instead, well, you know, which cells of the brain does this protein interact with? How does this protein interact with those cells of the brain? And so on. Again, there's, not, there's no attempt to falsify anything here. Perhaps even worse for the falsificationist are cases of dogmatism in science. Uh, the falsificationist claims that scientists should always be critical. They should always subject their theories to severe tests. Now, the worry is that theories are often shielded from potential problems to give them time to develop. Uh, interestingly, general relativity, which Popper considers to be uh, the... I guess, paradigm example of a, a great scientific theory. General relativity is perhaps uh, a good example of, of this sort of thing. Uh, one of the things that prompted the development of general relativity was the Michelson-Morley experiment. Uh, in the 19th century, it was believed that light was composed of waves in a substance known as the luminiferous ether. The ether was thought to pervade all of space, and it should provide a, a kind of universal frame of reference um, against which the motion of of everything else can be measured. As the Earth uh, moves in its orbit around the Sun, it, it moves through the ether. And the thought was that this should result in different speeds of light beams 
depending on their direction, because light that moves with the ether will have a greater speed than light moving against the ether or light moving perpendicular to the ether. Um, the exact details of the experiment are not important, but uh, Michelson and Morley obtained a null result. Their experiment uh, showed that the speed of light is constant in all directions. Um, you can look this up on online. There are uh, a lot of good YouTube videos explaining how this experiment works and why it was important if you want more details. Uh, the point for us uh, is this, this result was an important step in the development of general relativity. However, in the 1920s, a uh, scientist called Dayton Miller used equipment that was far more sensitive than uh, Michelson, Michelson and Morley's and obtained results that apparently showed different speeds of light, contradicting Einstein's theory. How did other scientists respond? Well, they pretty much just ignored him. Uh, there were a couple of scientists who repeated Miller's experiments and found a, a constant speed of light, just as Michelson and Morley did. Um, but Miller uh, perhaps reasonably objected that their experiments were not performed under such good conditions or with such sensitive equipment as his was. Um, by and large, the physics community ignored Miller for about two or three decades. His work was decisively refuted only in 1955, uh, when Robert Shankland and his colleagues reanalyzed uh, Miller's experiment and found that um, the, the apparent evidence for different light speeds was, was spurious. So Miller was wrong. His results do not threaten Einstein's theory. But the point is that this was not actually demonstrated for over two decades. The anomalous data was mostly just ignored. Now the question is, were scientists justified in ignoring Miller? Well, arguably yes. Uh, relativity theory is a remarkably uh, powerful and novel theory. Uh, it was still very young when Miller performed his experiments, uh, and it, it still showed a great deal of promise. Why suspend um, you know, a, a great theory just because of a few, anom a few anomalous results? You know, results that uh, f very few other people had the equipment to test properly. Uh, any theory needs time to develop. Um, but... You know, this this is not the kind of ultra critical attitude that the fault that the falsificationist seems to require, um, and so we might we might sort of worry about these cases where theories seem to face uh, anomalous data, they seem to face problems, um, and scientists just largely ignore those problems and just work on developing the theory. Uh, a final problem is that there are whole areas of science which don't seem to be so responsive to testing. So uh, systematics and taxonomy and biology provide a pretty good example. You may have heard the claim made recently that birds are dinosaurs. Uh, dinosaurs never actually went extinct. Birds are quite literally a dinosaur lineage. Now part of this is an empirical question. Did birds evolve from dinosaurs living hundreds of millions of years ago? Well here it's possible to apply the falsificationist method. But there's also a question about how our classification systems should work. So there's a question of you know, what counts as a dinosaur. The standard view these days is that the term dinosaur refers to a clade, and a clade includes a lineage of organisms plus all the organisms that evolved from that lineage. On this view, if we establish that birds evolved from dinosaurs, then we've established that birds are dinosaurs. Uh, this approach to classification emphasizes evolutionary relationships, but they're very different approaches. Uh, on another approach, organisms should be classified on the basis of morphological similarity. Uh, so evolutionary relationships are, are irrelevant, you just look at the uh, physical similarities of the organisms. Um, on, on this view then, if birds are sufficiently different from the earlier dinosaurs, then they won't count as dinosaurs even if they evolved from dinosaurs. I have a video uh, related to this called Philosophy of Biology, the Species Problem, uh, which might be worth checking out if you're interested. The point for now is that this doesn't seem to be uh, an entirely empirical debate. No amount of empirical data can tell us whether we should classify species on the basis of patterns of ancestry and descent, or on the basis of similarity, or on some other basis. I mean, 
it doesn't seem like you can falsify a method of classification. We might be, we might be able to show that uh, a particular method of classification is, is overly complex uh, or that it's perhaps misleading in certain ways, uh, but it, it's not the sort of thing that you can falsify. Um, and yet there is much debate among biologists about the proper methods of classification. There are even scientific journals devoted specifically to the topic. Okay, so those are some, some difficulties for uh, falsificationism. Before ending, uh, it may be worth asking, is falsificationism an empirical claim about how science actually works, uh, or is it a normative claim about how science should work? Right? So, so is it a claim about what the, scientific, what the method scientists use actually is, or, or is it a claim about the method scientists should follow? Either way, we're going to face difficulties. If we treat falsificationism as an empirical claim, then it seems like it's been falsified. Uh, there are all sorts of contexts where scientists do not adopt the falsificationist method. On the other hand, if it's a normative claim, right, if it's telling us how scientists should behave, then we need to ask, you know, what, on what grounds do a bunch of philosophers feel that they're justified in demanding that scientists change their ways. It seems kind of presumptuous for philosophers to go around telling scientists that they're not doing their jobs properly. So, you know, what, what grounds are there for thinking that adopting the method of falsificationism would actually help scientists? I mean, science seems to be getting along perfectly fine as it is. Uh, so, if we're going to demand quite significant changes in science, you know, what's the justification for that? It seems seems presumptuous. So uh, that's falsificationism, and um, that's all we'll be having on on. That's all I'll be talking about on that topic. Uh, so while Popper's theory is uh, very powerful, it, it does face um, a number of quite serious difficulties. Uh, and um, next video we'll start to look at uh, Thomas Kuhn. Um, but that's all for today. Thanks for watching.